This isn't actually the presentation. This is just because I want to show you a resource. Um, you were asking about some other So this is the National Association of Dual Diagnosis website. And it has some useful um, useful publications. Um, so you have you know mental health approaches to intellectual developmental disabilities. They have a bunch on trauma responsive or reformed care, a bunch of it. And <laughs> it was actually been bring with it. Um, and we forgot to write it. So. So this one here, it's written as kind of an adjunct to the DSM. So what it does is take the DSM diagnostic criteria and then it adds in what it might look like with a person of mild intellectual disability, with a person who's got moderate intellectual disability, a person who has severe profound intellectual so it kind of does a crosswalk. It also has, and I have no financial interest in the DMA, but, um, it also has a section on um, behavioral phenotypes. So certain um, genetic disorders that are correlated with having IDD also have some behaviors in common, some behavioral presentations in common. So it has a small section on that as well. So it's just useful if, if you're going to find yourself um, and, and you're working with people with IDD a lot and you want a little extra help if you do have to diagnose people with mental illness. Mind you, I diagnose people you know without benefit of the book for years, but so you don't absolutely need it, but it has some pretty cool information. Um just so when I was on the other screen, had a bunch of things about you know how to diagnose an autism and pervasive um, disorders and things like that as well. There's also books about how to adapt therapy models for people with IDD. And um, the ones It's not, it's not showing up in there. There's one we lend to Turning Point at the center all the time. He may have some little brown book. Yeah. Um, that goes through several different treatment models and um, how you can just change up how you provide the therapy. Still stay within um, fidelity to the model, but how you can make tweaks to it to accommodate people with that. So that's, I just wanted to show you that it's bmad.org and um, it's just useful because it's got a lot of this, uh, resources that you can use there. Um, so what I'm going to do today is show you some general modifications you know, to, to kind of a hodgepodge of um, schools of therapy but um if you want to drill down any specific one you may be able to find a reference that you're looking for on that website another website that has a lot of um, literature on working with people with idd and also some testing assessment materials is um, the aaidd website american association of intellectual developmental disabilities so that's just a couple of resources for you. Okay. So I co-wrote this with a colleague um, who wasn't available. 
she she teaches um, university level courses in San Antonio and Austin area. So some of this <clears throat> she could get into more detail than I can on it. So just bear with me, okay? And her name is um, Dr. Mary Chavez. So I mentioned I was on a grant program. Okay. Transition support team activities are funded with federal money follows the person grant. Um, grant numbers on the slide. The funds allow us to provide educational opportunities, which is what this is. Um, our target audience is actually local intellectual developmental authorities, um, HES and Texas Home Living Providers, class providers, blind multiple disabilities providers. When I say providers, it's um, those are the people actually providing the service. So, like in IDD land, your local authority is linking people to a service and monitoring the service. The providers are the people that do the hands-on work and training and residential support someone. Okay. And mental health women, if you go on the mental health side and you have a case manager and, and you know you see a psychiatrist in the house, they're actually providing direct services. Okay. And IDD land on the authority side, it's they're providing the service of service coordination. It's an alphabet soup. Okay. <laughs> But it's so you don't go in there and you don't see the doctor there on site, right? Um, unless you're in the program, what we call a health provider, the local authority is not helping you with your house and like it, it's outsourced to somebody in private. Um, so we exist to try to teach them how to provide better services. Um, the idea behind this grant was to help um, by providing more training and supports and information and whatnot, was to try to keep people out of institutions like the state support living center, jail, long term hospitalization, things like that. That's the idea behind the grant. Hence, money follows the person. So, if the person lives in the community, Money goes to the community to try to support them staying. Um, and this particular transition support team, because there are eight in Texas. Um, so this particular one serves the 17 counties starting up around B, like Lego counties, down to the valley and over to Gray. So we serve anybody who is in coastal plant service area. Border region service area, tropical Texas services area, and U.S. centers service area. So we, we looked out because we, everything's within a three hour drive. There's one based in Dallas. They have pretty much the entire Louisiana Texas border. They have to contend. So it, the, the teams have different geographical areas. On the state, but every every part has them. Um, this disclaimer at the bottom basically says the federal government gave Texas money to give to us, but the federal government doesn't necessarily endorse what I'm presenting today. They do approve it, it actually goes through an approval process, but I am not approving for the federal government. Um, so I mentioned. There's a lot of co occurring problems, right? In a person who has 90D, a lot of them have mental illness. In fact, they're diagnosed with mental illnesses at a higher rate than people in the general population. So, because of that, you can't really ignore psychotherapy if you want to help somebody you know, live their best life. Because there's been a, there's, it gets underreported, right? Or they figure, okay, they have IDD, they're not going to understand therapy, so let's just throw pills out and let the medicine fix it. Do you guys, in general, y'all think that works 
to truly, you know, address an emotional problem or a, or a thought disturbance kind of thing? No. The research shows, right? If you combine psychotherapy plus medicine, you get a better outcome than you have with just psychotherapy or just medicine alone. And that research has been around forever. And they, you know, keep checking it again. The results keep coming out that way. So you can't really ignore psychotherapy if you want to do right by this population. Um, so the idea behind the presentation is to talk about various therapies, how they can be modified if needed um, to provide some more options for clinicians who might be wanting to work with people who are newly diagnosed with a mental illness and an intellectual disability. So this applies to everybody, right? The need for psychotherapy is greater than the supply of psychotherapists, right? But the need for counselors is higher than the amount of counselors. I mean, we have a bunch here because this is a college that people are turning up counselors. <laughs> Some of them stick around, right? But other parts, you know, of, of the U.S. and the state, they don't have that, right? And so that's when you know, telemedicine and all that other comes into play. Um, the and then, you know, there's other people we think need therapy and they don't think they need therapy, right? Because there's a lot of distress in it. So, how much, I mean, have y'all been receiving a lot of training about working with people with disabilities or intellectual disabilities on this group? Today with all me? Yeah, pretty much, right? There's not a class for it. <laughs> I didn't get any specialized training. I mean, they, I mean, I had a behaviorist, you know, in my graduate program. So he taught us about, you know, behavior, you know, therapy and behavior management is what they called it back then and all that. But again, I was on the psych side. They don't, they don't touch on it as much in counseling because it's not considered a counseling advantage. So the, tra the, the training is not out there. You have to kind of learn on your own. Even medical doctors. And I've asked a few to, see, to make sure this is true. They don't necessarily receive specialized training in working with somebody with an intellectual disability. So if they want to go into that field, you know, they have to kind of put together a network. And again, there's there's websites on that, um, usually put out by universities. So it's a company called Intellectability that does training for medical professionals on common health issues with people with IDD and things like that. Um, there's um, the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center at, I'm trying to think of the name of the university. It might be Vanderbilt University. Um, has like a crosswalk of like, what to, how, to, how to help your person with IDD, you know, have a successful doctor visit, kind of thing, right? And they have flow charts for MDs to follow, you know, this is a person who did this, this has happened, okay, then check for this, 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 you know? Because there's not a lot of formal training out there at the school level um, to work with people with IDD. So, because there's not a lot of training, there's a lot of people that aren't really willing to treat people who are dying diagnosed with it because they, they don't feel comfortable with it, right? It's like, I don't know this population. Um, attitudes about people with mental illness and IDD. I was telling your professor over there that back in the day, and there's still some of it that goes on, um, they just, don't talk about it as openly anymore. There was a belief that people with IDD couldn't have mental illness because they lacked the emotional capacity to have a mental disorder. It's not true. I've worked with too many people who have mental illness. <laughs> you know, it's like it's definitely not true. But they have that attitude, you know, that they couldn't have both. 
but they weren't cognitively able to have a mom. And there's still some of that floating around, although happily not as much. And then again, lack of ID with specific skills. People don't feel comfortable um, you know, applying their skills to somebody they don't know how it's going to take. And then you just have this stigma. It's um, a lot of times people with ID are looked upon as, say, second class citizens. They're not, not worthy of my care. Again, I'm not expressing a personal belief. I'm just sharing the beliefs that are out there. So this causes some problems when somebody's you know, with care. So, as I mentioned, the, the mental health system and the IDD system, they're, they're related to each other. They're, you know, operated in this county by the same company, but they're two different animals. Um, the mental health system is looking for cure, treatment, recovery-oriented stuff, right? Y'all you know, had... Um, any classes on like the, the whole idea of recovery from mental illness and all that? Not yet. We had a training on the IMR curriculum um, several semesters ago. Yeah. Um, so there's some discussion on that. Yeah, that, that's kind of that. Yeah. So because for some things, they're not necessarily a cure, but you learn to recover from your illness, which is how to manage your symptoms to the point where they don't interfere with your daily life as much. It's the shortest way I can think of it. Um, so, like, if you have, I mean, it, it, again, it's going to depend on what's going on. If you have a severe case of schizophrenia and you can take all the neuroleptics in the world, but you still have voices, right? You learn how to come to terms with the voices and you know go about and do what you need to do to to thrive within your world. So that's the, the normal idea. IDD, the care is focused on habilitation without expectations and significant change of function, right? Because if I have an IQ of 50, there may be certain academic concepts that I'm just not going to get. I keep working on them. I may get better at it, but I may just never be able to achieve that, right? Maybe I don't have the fine motor skills to write letters. Um, maybe I don't have the abstract thinking ability to do higher math. Maybe I don't have an understanding of money. It doesn't mean that I can't keep working on learning those things because I might actually learn them. It may take a very long time, but if it's important to me to learn them, I may work at it hard enough to finally, you know, get some kind of system in place, right? But you don't always get significant changes. In that. It doesn't mean, and I don't really like the way we phrase that <laughs> slide. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're never going to gain skills you don't have. It just means it's a process. Yeah. So, mental illness treatment, you're looking at short term goals. IDD, you're looking at you know, life term, lifelong goals. So, I may not know how to dress myself without assistance. But that doesn't mean that five, 10 years down the line, I might not master it. But mental health isn't looking at five, 10 years down the line on their goals, right? So you're taking a long time. So significant change doesn't mean no, you know, lack of significant change doesn't mean no change. It just means it's continuing the increments. So, in general, and this is kind of old, but I looked at some newer stuff and the stats are close to the same anyway. 
about one out of three people gets diagnosed with a mental illness who also has a mental illness. So 30, 33%. That's higher than the rate in people who don't also have physical disease. Um, individuals with, with mental illness, of course, uh, with intellectual disability, can have any mental illness a person without intellectual disability. Um, for a very long time, a lot of mental health professionals believe that people with IDD I'm just going to call it IDD or DDT, rather than having to keep saying intellectual development. But they thought they couldn't have a mental illness because they thought that the intellectual deficits or the intellectual delays somehow protected them from getting illness. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, or they thought they can benefit from treatment even if they were in psychological distress. Because they thought, well, they're not going to understand. So why bother? Because um, a lot of people with intellectual disabilities have verbal communication problems. You know, or depending on their level of intellectual disability, they may not have a lot of self insight. Right? So they figure, well, okay, so if they can't gain insight, then what's the point of doing therapy? Um, so everything that they would do, it's a behavior, and you address it through behavior modification and apply behavior analysis and behavior support plans and all these other things. So the idea was that they were going to use opera. You know what opera conditioning is? You know that much? Okay. <laughs> okay. So they were going to use opera conditioning techniques on these people to try to cure whatever emotional problems they had. That's what it boils down to. Because you know they didn't have the intellectual capacity to benefit from this higher order, you know, thing called therapy. Um, it's not true, but historically that's what the people. So back in '83, so even before I went to grad school, um, there was a psychologist called Steve Rice, and he coined the term diagnostic overshadowing, and. What he's using that word for was to describe the tendency to assess individuals with IDD um, less accurately. Okay. So what people would do is they look at the, at the intellectual disability and they would let that diagnosis overshadow everything else that was going on with the person. So everything would get attributed to the fact that the person had an intellectual disability rather than maybe they've been traumatized, maybe they have depression, maybe they have a psychotic disorder. So that's why diagnostic you know, overshadowed. The, the intellectual disability was so obvious that that's all the professionals could focus on. And so it's, it's basically a bias that impacts the clinician's judgment regarding co-occurring disorders. Um, there's a three to six time increased rate of psychiatric and behavior problems and in intellectual disability um, as compared to the general population. So general population, what is it? It's about one every five, one out of every five people might experience mental illness. If you're looking at something like major depressive disorder, about twenty percent. And so you can see the difference. The prevalence of diagnosed anxiety and mood disorders within the ID population is more than double that of the general population. And that one's out of the DSM. Um, if you include defining your psychiatric disorders to include the range of behavioral disturbances, folks, that people with intellectual disabilities often present with, um, prevalence rates have been reported to be as high as 80%. Okay. 
and the variance in the prevalence rates related to basically how complex it is to try to define and discern if a person's got a psych, you know, psychiatric disorder or behavioral disturbance or something else going on. Because, um, for example, a person can have epilepsy, and if they have temporal lobe epilepsy, um, a lot of times that's associated with hallucinations. Not always, but not uncommon. So you're dealing with somebody who might have a medical problem that could cause what looks like a psychiatric, you know, situation. Or do they have a psychiatric thing in addition to the medical problem, right? Or do they talk to themselves because just that's how they process thought because that goes with their developmental level. level. So, you know, is it that they have an imaginary friend? Or is it hallucination? So you have all these different layers you've got to look at when you're trying to decide, you know, A, does somebody have an illness? B, what is it? Um, so it's it can be interesting you know, to, to figure out what's going on. <clears throat> so a lot of things. There's a lot of factors that have been found to contribute to the higher than average rates of psychiatric disorders um, that are experienced by people with IDD. Um, so y'all were talking about some of these earlier. Low levels of social support, right? Uh, poorly developed social skills. Do people, are, are people just born with social skills? Do they come out of nowhere? I mean, do you just come out of the room polite, you know, and know that you're supposed to say please and thank you and wait your turn? Not really. <laughs> okay. So these things have to be taught. And sometimes people have trouble catching on to them. And that's why they're poorly developed. Like like your like your guy in your case study, right? Or sometimes people don't bother teaching them because they figure, oh well, he's got ID, he's got a disability, so. He can't learn anyway. You know. And so they let them get away with bloody murder until they're bigger than they are. And then it, all of a sudden it's a problem and we have to call the police. Right? So some of it's lack of, of effort to teach. Some of it's just having trouble catching on to the concept. Right? So different reasons for why people have social skills. Um, and sometimes people have social skills or totally okay in their environment, but when they interact with the general public, things don't go well. So what's accepted in one venue is unaccepted in another. Um, sense of learned helplessness and correspondingly low sense of self-efficacy. All right. People with IDD are often told what they can't do or what they're never going to be able to learn or what they're never going to be able to do. It's a fact. It's a shame, but it's a fact. So if you were in that situation and all you ever heard was, well, you're never going to go to college. Oh, you want to be an astronaut? No, you can't be an astronaut. You're in special ed. Yeah. If, if you heard messages like that, right, you're, you're never going to be able to drive a car. You can't get married because you have money, right? What do you think that does to your, your sense of self, your self esteem or your sense of self mastery or self efficacy? Yeah, lowers it. And those are the messages a lot of people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities get. And it may, and, and I, I know it sounds like, well, everybody's just being mean to them. It may be that somebody thinks they're trying to be kind. So that the person's not set up for disappointment. Because they're trying to protect the person. Right? So it's not always done in a bad way. A lot of times it is. I mean, it's it's why the federal government basically outlawed the terminal retardation, because it was it had turned into from, from being a, term, a psychological term that just basically meant the mental processes were retarded or slowed, right? It turned into this whole other, you know, 
belittling, denigrating thing, right? So now we have like hate because of how the term came, you know, like changed in its use, right? From descriptive to an insult. Before they used that term, they used idiot, imbecile, and moron. And y'all know what those mean now, right? You don't know, idiot, imbecile, right? So that was their, their terminology for levels of different um, levels of ID that predate using the word it's mentally deficient. And you know, you wouldn't should not go around calling people those words. So things, you know, get bad connotations. But, so we have to watch our language. But people learn that they can't do because people tell them they can't do it. Or because they keep trying and failing, right? So they get that sense of burn holes. That's from supplement, right? Um, low socioeconomic level, again, a lot of times they fall in low socioeconomic levels because, quite frankly, the jobs they're offered, if, if they can work, um, don't pay much. Or they're in a training program forever, they're getting paid a training wage, which is actually less than minimum wage. Um, or they came from some of Low SES to begin with. And there's a higher correlation of having a physical disability, but a higher, a higher probability of also having physical disabilities along with intellectual disabilities. Because a lot of intellectual disability is caused by some sort of trauma to the brain, right? Either in utero, at birth. Or like shortly thereafter, kind of thing. It's some disease or, or physical injury to the brain. Also, the genetic things that contribute to ID differences. A lot of them also come through <coughs> corresponding, you know, physical anomalies. Um, and then, when a family has somebody in it due to disability. There's a lot more stress in that family usually because their child needs more, you know, care and support than they have received. Doesn't mean it's always that way, but it's frequently that way. Um, and the families have to contend with stigma too, right? Because their child's different. So he told me the, the, and it's not a term I grew up with because we didn't have them where I, where I went to school. But they talk about, you know, the kids on the short bus. So that, they told me that was the corporate term. <laughs> okay. We didn't, you know, it's like the kids label, right? These kids are evil to each other, basically. It's, it's, a, it's a phase they all go through. And <laughs> so, these things are damaging to the person they have. So they're going to contribute to somebody having issues like depression, right? They're going to contribute to people maybe having anxiety disorder. Right? And those are things you know, that you can address to them. Um, some other things. Um, more likely to have you know, central nervous system damage than somebody without a disability. Um, by definition, they generally have more problems with reading and other language um, issues. Decreased opportunities to learn adaptive coping skills. Um, and that one is kind of twofold. One is like sometimes their support system tries to protect them from being hurt. And so the person might not have the opportunities to participate in the social activities where people learn how to get along with each other and cope with stress and cope with failure. Because somebody's well meaning is sort of wrapping them in, in emotional cotton balls, you know, so they won't be hurt. 
Um, other times, it's just because they're not allowed somewhere, or maybe they've got a lot of physical problems and use adaptive equipment like wheelchairs or walkers or braces or whatnot. And the the thing they want to do just isn't physically accessible, right? So like maybe the kid wants to play sports and you in sports kids learn a lot of things, right? They learn cooperation, hopefully. <laughs> they learn cooperation. Um, sometimes they learn you know, how to control their emotions better, how to deal with loss and whatnot, right? Um, but maybe the kid with the intellectual and developmental disability can't do those things because their body doesn't like them. Or sometimes you know, they don't want um, people who are afraid that somebody will get physically hurt, so they ban them from doing certain things. Sort of so it cuts down on the things for the events and supports available to them for other kids go to learn how to cook. The kid with IDD doesn't necessarily have the same set of things to change. Um, a lot higher rate of metabolic diseases, um, get a lot of infections. A lot of times, these guys have to spend a bunch of their childhood in doctor's offices having very painful procedures and surgeries done because of what's going on with their body. Um, and that ties into increased likelihood of experiencing early trauma. They're at higher risk for medical trauma. Um, they're at higher risk for what we usually think of as trauma and abuse because people prey on those that are weaker. Getting the old one, the thing I did in February, we went into the people getting preyed on. Um, people get frustrated and hit kids and things like that. Right. Maybe kids need your, they're going to move up the, the possibility of, of getting hit in these that way. Um, so, all these contribute to, to why they might have higher rates of psychiatric needs. Um, so, as I touched on earlier, differentiating between the person's psychiatric disorder. And just what's the limitation of their behaviors can be different. Um, so symptoms that might be a mental health issue are frequently interpreted one way in the person that aren't known to have IDD than they are if the person is known to IDD. So like you can give somebody a list of symptoms and the person might even say, oh, that person has blank. Or you can give the same clinician a list of symptoms and add in the sentence, but the person has IDD. And the answer might come back with, well, that's a behavior. Um, that was a lot. The, there aren't good stats on the frequency of suicide attempts for people with IDD because people can't tell if it's a behavior, like an impulse control thing, or the person's trying to kill themselves. And they don't usually parse it out the stats on the, on the death certificates. So it's hard to tell, right? And then you have that bias of diagnostic overshadowing. Um, or they like, it misunderstood. It's like, okay, so if the person has this um, medical issue, well, then most likely that's just their medical issue. Um, a person can, all right, so if a person normally tells them to drive along the street with them, water, and they open the door and they jump out. Well, the question is, what might you interpret that as? I can see how it could 
be a suicide attempt or it could be if someone has the intellectual disability just doesn't have the cognitive awareness that that's not a safe that's not safe right yeah. Yeah. so you can look at it you know which, which was it right is it lack of safety skills is it because they got told to leave the area when they're mad and so whenever they get mad they try to leave the whole area they're in without regard for what's going on around them right or this person with illnesses I have a person with normal intelligence who's not under the influence of anything because <laughs> they're high on drugs, potentially. But if, if they're like sober, riding down the road and they jump out of the car, does your mind go more to maybe that's not almost? If it does, don't feel bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's where most people's you know, mind goes, right? That something's wrong with it. To go get checked out, but you throw IDD in the mix, you don't know because there's lots of different things that could contribute to their acting. Um, <clears throat> so here's some of the other challenges in just diagnosing people with psychiatric disorders. In the first um, and this is from a couple of people called Sahar and Charlie, and they. I cited the original, but there's a lot of research they've done since then. Um, so cognitive disintegration, people tend to decompensate under stress. Do y'all agree with that? People in general tend to decompensate under stress. Like we all lose a few of our key points in <laughs> okay, anyway. So if somebody is struggling to function anyway. Like, so my baseline effort of functioning took all the cognitive resources I had. And you throw a bunch of stress at me. I'm going to be compensated. Okay, because I was barely eating at the morning. <laughs> so sometimes in our population, and even with people with IID, um, People will present, you know, psychotic looking, you know, presentations, um, and some people will be able to. Now, some people with IDD do that anyway, because that is so vulnerable. So it's hard to talk about. So cognitive disintegration, that can be Psychological masking refers to like the person's limited life experiences and what their intellectual capacity is, right? How well do they do things like think in the abstract? Um, so that can influence the content of psychiatrics. If you, like I mentioned, um, imaginary friends earlier. Many kids go through a period of their life where they have imaginary friends. The kid's not psychotic, it's just a phase, usually like a source of comfort for the child. Sometimes it's a scapegoat for the child. I didn't do it, so like, you know, part of you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a development phase. Sometimes people with IDD keep their imaginary friends into adulthood. It's just where they are developing. It's hard to tell if that's you know a hallucination or is it a measure. Um, sometimes somebody could you know be having hallucinations or um, delusions when you're talking to them and you're not picking up on them because they don't sound terribly bizarre to you because the person's brain just hasn't gotten there. It just doesn't go there. It's hard to tell. Um, intellectual distortion. The person is having trouble describing things in languages. They don't have the vocabulary for it. 
they never get involved in it. You'll see this when we do counseling with kids before they got really abstract thinking yet. Um, so you're you're talking to them, you're like, well, how do you feel? They don't think it's fun. Okay. You might get mad. Mad is used for everything. Like any kind of unhappy might be classified as anger. Or any kind of unhappy might be classified as sad. Because they don't have the words, the vocabulary to parse it out. I feel frustrated. I'm despondent. They don't have those words necessarily. And so it kind of distorts how they present when you're trying to hear that and explain it to them. Um, when you have baseline exaggeration. So maybe somebody just has a behavior you don't like and they do over time. <laughs> okay. And it has nothing to do with normalness. <laughs> but the person develops an illness, and all of a sudden, what they did all along gets worse. It gets more frequent, it gets more severe. Because the, the mental illness is basically exacerbating the existing unwanted behavior. But people are just like, oh, that's just him being him. He always does that. Because he did it, maybe he, maybe he has it for decades, right? So that kind of contributes to difficult symptoms. Somebody coming in from the outside might notice the difference, but somebody who works with a person every day, day in, day out, you don't always notice changes in behavior until they're huge. So if the Onset of uh, emotional problems or thought problems is gradual. Maybe, the, let me give you an example. Maybe the person um, did what we skin tone, or like always like picking up their skin. You may not notice that it got a lot worse if like, it gradually increased over a period of time. And if you step back and look at you never used to do it that much. So, because it could be, you know, they've developed an anxiety disorder. Which is unhappy. Or something else. So, so what I want to do. And this one's on the screen. The, the other two, I pulled out of articles and we can do them or not do them, but this one, y'all can read along with me. Um, one to look at it. It's what you think's going on. Okay. Uh, Mr. L is a 20 year old single white male who resides with his older brother and his brother's family. And Mr. L and his brother came for a follow up after a medical hospitalization. In the hospital, Mr. L had two episodes of acute agitation requiring emergency use of benzodiazepine and an antipsychotic. The exact precipitants for the episodes were somewhat difficult to ascertain, but the patient's sister-in-law, who observed one of them, indicated that Mr. L seemed to be giving orders to the nursing staff as though he believed he knew what treatments other patients required. Um, Mr. L was transported to the hospital when his family believed he was having a reaction to pain medicine following a dental procedure, which they thought caused a dramatic increase in his level of energy and a complaint of feeling very anxious, irritable, and unwilling or unable to focus and follow directions. <coughs> Mr. L was typically very introverted and quiet. Indeed, the family was initially pleased when he appeared to be more social and talkative and more willing to spend time with him. They had not noticed the initial decrease in his sleep due to his tendency to spend time in his room alone most times after dinner. 
About one week prior to hospitalization, Mr. L had insisted that he be allowed to play a video game despite having no prior interest in or skill in the game. Later, his brother discovered him endlessly looking at the graphics of the game, which featured the lips of his women, but not actually playing the game. Mr. L began talking in an animated manner about wishing to get a car and a driver's license. He was interested in becoming an emergency medical technician or firefighter and began to make frequently frequent requests for his allowance. So here you have a guy who was originally maybe withdrawn, quiet, didn't spend a lot of time around people, and now he's doing the same thing. What if you didn't have IDD? What would you do? Yeah. <laughs> Got a little grandiose there, right? Got interested in sex. Wasn't sleeping. It sounds a little mad. I mean, he could have had a reaction to pain. <coughs> Not saying he, I mean, because people have paradoxical effects to the medicine. And if you have a bunch of physical stuff going on with you, you may be more prone to have a weird reaction to traumatic injury. But, um, you know, if he wasn't ordinarily unwilling to focus, you know, unable to focus in all directions, you think that that might make him. But what happens in diagnostic overshadowing, you see that person has got IDD. So what is it? Right. So this is just an example of diagnostic overshadowing. Um, and it's interesting when you show this, because if you show this to a bunch of people who, who primarily work in IDD, they just think it's IDD. The, you know, finally, now he's interested in sex. <laughs> Because he was delayed in that interest or whatever. Um, when you show it to people who mostly work in the kitchen and you know, don't think much about it, they think maybe. So it's just to give you an idea. Yeah. What it is in this case, who knows? You'd want, I mean, what would be useful? Would it be useful to know if, say, there was a family history of bipolar disorder? Mm -hmm. Right? It would be useful to know what this baseline was. It just talks about it a little bit about how it usually But it, it would it would be very useful to know like how far off his wrong he is. How different he is from his usual self. And if you think about it, that's what you want to know if you're diagnosing somebody who doesn't have an actual explosion too. Right? You want to know that something happened at the house. Something you know out of his world is he's reacting differently to. So the same kind of info you want if you were assessing anybody with that person. The difference being that sometimes with people with IDD, you're having to rely on third party reports more than the person's report. That can be problematic because the third party might be interpreting. The person's behavior incorrectly. If the person has verbal problems, you know, kind of like do a lot of observation and a lot of relying on others to give you the Um. So, subtle changes in behavior were overlooked because of the baseline system. So. It is normal it's just to go hang out in his room and nobody bothered to check to see if he slept or not. How would you know if he had a change in his sleep? Um, he had a supportive environment around him, so he was able to decompensate without anybody really noticing for him. Yeah. 
they thought, oh, he's finally coming out of his shell. This is a good thing. He wants to spend time with us. <laughs> and um, he wasn't able to articulate his thoughts and feelings all that well. So it kind of added to it. Right? He might not have been able to tell you know, the nurses at the hospital, well, I know what needs to be done with these patients and blah, 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 because he didn't have the ways to explain it. So he just kind of started boxing around and telling them, oh, he needs that treatment, he needs that treatment. But maybe you can say, you know, I feel really, really smart and I understand what this is. Um, so it's not bad that he was in um, a supportive environment. It's really good that he had a supportive environment. It just made it harder to figure out that something was changing. Um, he might not have been able to tell people that he felt like he was on top of the if, if, if he didn't feel good. Um, if a person like always had poor sleep habits, I no wonder if that's cool. Something when they have really bad sleep habits. Sometimes it's hard to tell changing. Is it unusual or hopefully you aren't doing this because it's not healthy, but it's college. It's like you stay up. For several days on end, you know, cramming for things or you know, getting stuff done, and then you're exhausted and crash. Okay, it, I mean, it just is right. Situational sleep. So, <laughs> but if you took somebody you know out in the community doing it, maybe they weren't trying to meet deadlines or whatever. Would you think about it differently? So it's kind of hard to tell sometimes. Um, you might not notice, you know, people might not pay any attention to the fact that the person has this if, if they already have weird sleep habits. Um, a person who has a habit of talking to her herself when they're mad anyway. And again, you don't have to have an intellectual disability to do that. It's a way we need to soothe ourselves. Um, they might not draw all attention, right? Because they always do. But they might not be talking to themselves anymore like they used to. They might be responding to this nature. Um, so when the person has an intellectual disability, a lot of times it's just due to wrong because they have an intellectual disability. But the, the same idea of diagnostic pattern can apply to somebody with that. So when you want to like serve somebody and, and provide counseling services to them, just like for anybody, you want to assess that person's communication style, um, their level of emotional understanding, right? Um, you want to know like how to work with that one individual sitting across from you, right? If you're a good counselor. If you're a good counselor, it's not one size fits all. Maybe I shouldn't say good. Maybe I should say effective. All right. You want to work that way. You can be very good at empathy and well-meaning. Maybe better doesn't work for you. So if you want to be a more effective counselor, um, you want to assess the person. So with IDD, you also want to take into account their level of cognitive. So if you can have some info about it, it's useful. It's not a requirement, but it's useful. Um, and what, I'm, what I mean by this isn't to decide whether or not the person's going to benefit from there. All right, in, this, in our example, we're talking about they're going to get therapy. So how do I go about doing it? Um, most of the research talks about 
the needing to adjust the mode of therapy provided to fit the person's developmental level. So, like, kind of where they are emotionally, like what age range are they at emotionally? Um, their dependence needs. So, do they need supports in their way? Right. Um, and their verbal and cognitive abilities are patient. So, if they're not, if they have a lot of trouble with expressive language, so their ability to communicate with you using words, then maybe a therapy that requires them giving you verbal answers isn't the solution. Right? Maybe for them, something more experiential or expressive, or a different kind of expression with it. Right. Um, if they have good receptive language, so they're really good at understanding what you say, then maybe you know, more traditional talk therapy is good. So you need to get some information. And some of it you can get you know, through working with the person and getting to know them better. Um, some of it you might be able to jumpstart by looking at assessments and things that others have done. Um, and you're, you're going to want to, um, people don't, I've got a slide coming up, kind of good, but kind of bad. <laughs> because it gives you generalities about developmental levels. But people don't um, mature even, for lack of a better way to explain this. So somebody may be, maybe you're working a 20 year old. Maybe they're at 20 year old level, what, what you'd expect from a 20 year old in terms of their desire to date, have interpersonal relationships, hormones, all that. Maybe they're at a teen-year-old level in terms of how they describe their emotions or express their emotions. And maybe they're at an eight-year-old level on like life skill stuff, like understanding money and so their development can be all over the place. Right? Their skills can be all over the place. It just depends on what's, what growth that intellectual disability, what part of their brain is functioning at different you know, times. So it makes it a little more interesting. Um, when you're doing interviews, it's important to remember these two things, right? You've got more than one kind of memory. Okay. Retrieval and recognition. Okay. Retrieval is your short answer questions on your test. Or you write an essay in response to the question. Those are harder, right? <laughs> okay. Usually. I mean, I've seen some pretty evil multiple choice tests, but in general, retrieval memory, memory is low. Recognition, you have something to look at, jog your memory. Okay. And so that's a simpler form of recall. So when you're trying to interview somebody to figure out what's going on, when you're trying to take a history, you need to keep that in mind because people with IDD might have more difficulties describing past events because some people have interesting ideas of the passage of time. Get it. Like everything happened last week. And they're describing it. They have trouble, like long ago stuff and recent stuff. It gets muddled in there. Um, or if in their brain they have it straight, but when they're describing it to you, things come out that they're not in order. So you're not getting a sequential telling. It may sound like a sequential telling, but it's not really. And so you're, you end up being confused. Like, I'm not quite sure what this happened. Um, so you can assist people describing past things when you're trying to make history by using anchor events 
to stimulate memory by using that recognition um, and sudden retrieval. Now, this is not what, you know, all that recovered memory stuff. This is not that. We don't want to put that. <laughs> You're not like putting things in, you know, to re it's more like you're you're giving them some anchor points to help them put things in a timeline that makes more sense to you. So some things you can do to kind of promote that recognition in life. You want to use interview questions and maybe give them multiple choice answers to pick from. Not a whole lot. But you can like start with two or three choices, and if none of them are right, then you can like give them another two. You don't want to overwhelm somebody by giving them a lot. Um, you could use things like line drawing or, or pictorial expression, um, anchor events, which I'm going to explain in a second. You want to use a lot of clarifying, summarizing, and tapping. Things that you would use, like um, if you were doing motivational interviewing, because you're checking to make sure that you're on the same page as they are, because you could be misunderstanding them. Um, just know that when you're doing that, um, sometimes there is a, a tendency of, of people with ID to answer you yes a lot. They'll agree with you verbally, but they're not really agreeing with you. It's because they get taught that it's better to agree than to not agree, because if I don't agree, then stuff happens that I don't like. So just know that. <laughs> um, so sometimes you have to tell them it's okay not to agree with me. You have to give them permission to tell you no. And, um, and of course, you're going to want to have shorter sessions as a rule to keep people's attention. So if you, all right, people with IDD basically have, many of them, many of them have difficulty forgotten on describing past events in an ambiguous fashion. So if, if they're telling you a story or, or like you ask them to make up a story about something. Um, so say you're saying, asking them, like, what happened last week at work when you were upset? You're digging for information, right? You want to know what the trigger to the feeling of upset was. What made them throw whatever it was across the room. You're looking for information to help them so that you can help them you know, deal with that emotion. Right? But that might be hard because it was last week. I did a lot of things that were last week. What do you mean by upset? So this is where the anger point comes in here. Um, so if you're providing a list of more memory triggers, um, you might be able to get slightly more accurate information. So if you have some information about the event ahead of time, this doesn't work if you're going in blind. <laughs> but if you have some information about the event, this can help. So you could ask a more specific question like, what happened on payday last week when you threw the bombs? So you're painting a more complete picture in your question which then helps them know what you're asking about. Because it wasn't seven days ahead of sensory at that point, it was just paid. And so having to figure out what you mean by the word upset, it's like throw the box or something like that. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So again, to, to pull that off, you have to have outside input. Which you may or may not always have. Um, so you like, how did you feel when blank happened? So like, if they're telling you a story, and they said Susan was mean to me and called me names, and I wanted to be mean. Backwards. Well, how did you feel when Susan? Instead of saying, how did you feel when that happened? Because that is general. But when Susan called me names, that's a more specific. Oh. 
Um, no, I've probably seen stuff like this before. So when I talk about control, I did emotion, I did a fire or line lines or whatever. It's that, it's that sort of thing. It's just to give them something to jump in. Some people do better with like drawings or cartoons. Some people do better with actual photographs. Of like smiling or angry faces. So again, it's finding out what speaks more to the person. Because it's kind of. And a lot of times, especially if they come in with a character or a family member, it's like in one. And, and like maybe the person said speech therapy or something. At that point, somebody else has probably already assessed them to figure out what kind of pictorial representations they're going to respond to. But you can also do it properly. <clears throat> A lot of times, they'll use things like you use them with kids. But I find these are helpful with adults making. Like if you have um, things like okay, red light, green light, yellow light to describe where they are emotionally. If red light means I'm gonna lose it, lose it green means I'm calling it. Or um you know, like pictorial scales and numerical scales. Like on this one saying. There's something like that. Would you say that it's better to have like just a few of like main primary emotions uh, to show them the different options that you find with, or you think like having a wide range would be better? If they've done a lot of therapy in their life, they might be able to do the, the wider range. To start, it's good to start with basics, just to see where you're at. So it's like, okay, I feel happy. And then maybe you have another thing different kinds of happiness. Yeah, that. Um, I just picked an, an easy one for the slide. If you get the, the really complicated ones, it's harder to start filming them apart. But a lot of the problem is that people aren't given the tools to express their emotions, right? So, you know, I said a lot of things, everything they'll tell you they're sad, and they're really just irate at something. Yeah. Or they're mad when they're sad. Because they didn't have no, nobody told them to learn a skill to feel. And so over time, you can teach them how to feel. If you start out with one, you know, and I know the kind you're talking about, they're great. You know, they have all sorts of different feelings on them. Um, it just would depend on how vocal the person is. So, what what's your life experience going in? They already know about you know pointing things to tell you, or they might say no, none of them is, and then you might have a different spot. <laughs> mm -hmm. so these take a lot of kids to really teach you, you know, words to go much because sometimes when you name something, it helps give you like a feeling of power over it. <clears throat> okay, I touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, so when you're doing a clinical interview with um, people who have IDD, it can be complicated by communication deficits, right? Speech impediments, you can have trouble understanding them. Um, they may be having understanding, trouble understanding you because you're talking really fast. Are you using big words that they haven't learned yet? Um, but you can learn you know, questions and what works to ask and what doesn't work to ask. Sometimes it's trial and error. Um, a lot of times you need to add a little more time for the answer. And we're all guilty of this. We ask a question and then we go on to the next question, we go on to the next question. The person's still processing question number one. Did you ever, um, anybody ever work with the elderly? 
if you work with somebody who has um, dementia training, and it applies to, to this population as well sometimes, it might take up to 20 seconds for them to process what you just asked them. And 20 seconds doesn't feel like a long time until you sit there and have to be quiet for 20 seconds. However, one, if, if, if you ever want the dementia people, uh, the dementia friends to come talk to your folks, they do um, about an hour, hour and a half worth of communication. Okay. So, but that's one of the things they point out. Make it easy for the person. Give them time to process the question before you throw another question. Um, And it also applies to people who are really depressed because a lot of times your thought process is slow when you have major depression. <clears throat> so be comfortable with silence. You're going to have to write down, or you're going to make your nuts. <laughs> okay. um, so somebody with expressive language doesn't necessarily have to be receptive language, and vice versa. So somebody can be talking to you up a storm using big words. It sounds like they know what they're saying. So you assume that they can understand when you answer through some of the big words and whatnot. You know. Um, same thing goes if a person doesn't speak, they don't use words to communicate. And people assume that because they don't use words to communicate, that they don't understand what's spoken to them. That's wrong. Um, so, general rule of thumb always assume they can understand you, or at least part of what they're saying. Because a lot of times, receptive language is better developed than expressive. But having good in one doesn't mean you have to have that. Or the other I don't have one. No. I'm just thinking. Yeah, I'm just thinking. <laughs> um, so, and that applies to not just um, people with IDD, it applies to people who are psychotic, um, people who have things like dementia or whatnot. You never know. Um, there's actually a few of the genetic conditions that are correlated with people having that I mean, they just broke over the storm. Very outgoing, talk really well. They think, you know, they've got it all. They don't. So it's easy, you know. So you have to use observational, you know, skills. You have to ask things in more than one way to make sure they understood you. Because again, like I said, people want to agree, they want to please you, and they don't want to look dumb. So what are they going to do? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody wants to be stupid, right? Nobody wants to look dumb. So just know that. Um, so if you don't understand, and, and then, again, these are general modifications. If you don't understand what they're telling you, it's okay to tell them you don't understand. Because, you know, we don't want to look stupid either, right? <laughs> okay. But don't make assumptions. Just ask them to show you in a different way or tell you. A lot of times, like, if, especially if they've got a communication device, that's what you use that. If they've got one, if, if you're not understanding. Um, the, the population is, by the, by the time they have adulthood, they're often used to people asking them to repeat things because they might have a speech impediment or something. People don't understand what they're saying. So you're not being offensive if you ask them, can you, can you repeat it? I don't understand. Um, 
if there's collateral source in the room, and this gets touchy. So if, if like a caregiver didn't know the room, you can ask the caregiver to help you, like help interpret, but you want to ask the person you're serving, your, your identified client first. You want to ask for permission before you do that crime. Couple of reasons. Main one is that's respectful. Any person with a disability, you're talking to somebody who's hearing impaired. You talk to the person, not to the deaf interpreter, right? The ASL person. You talk to the person with the hearing loss. So it's 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 the same. It's just being respectful. But the other thing you have to remember is that the person you brought into the appointment could be the person you met. Okay. Um, it could be somebody who has no idea what's going on, and maybe the person doesn't want to share in front of that person. So keep keep these things in mind. Um, who, what, where questions are easier to answer than when, how, and why questions? More concrete. It doesn't mean you can't ask when how and why questions. It's just know that they're harder. So if you can learn to phrase your question a different way, do that. Anybody ever deal with a, a kid who is in obnoxious mode and you ask them why and just say because over and over? Like we'll do the right. Like you're being on the spot. <laughs> so you don't want to put your, your people that you're trying to help on the spot. Um, you want to use open ended questions, but you might have to work up to them. So that's why we have like pictorial multiple choice or factual yes and no questions. And then you kind of grow up from there to, to more open ended ones. Sometimes if you start out with the open ended one, it's just too much. And so you need to go back. But I'm not saying you don't use. Open any questions, just um, sometimes you have to try them out for it. And with other people, you don't, they're, they're fine, but with some people, you do. And that would apply to people who have intellectual disabilities as well, especially if they're kind of worried about making a price. Um, hypotheticals, those are hard, so try not to do that. So, like, all those, you know. What if you could be anything in the world, blah, 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 blah. That might be too hard. So you don't need to use abstract control name questions. Now, somebody who's further along developmentally, you know, they may be fine with it. But if, if there are more concrete things they can say, those are hard. So don't do that. Um, jargon, slang, technical language. We have our own language as counselors sometimes. The outside world doesn't know what it is. Don't expect them to. <laughs> okay. You may not realize you talk in jargon until somebody's like, what in the heck are you talking about? Right? So try not to use jargon. That's all. Um, the more concrete you can be, Again, it's that abstract thinking versus concrete. If you're a person who uses you know a lot when you speak, the person with IDD may take it normally that they're supposed to know what you're talking about, but they don't, they don't know why. So try to edit those out. It's hard because we're not even conscious that we do it. But if you catch yourself doing that, try to edit them out because they might confuse somebody. Again, frequently check for understanding, make sure that y'all are on the same page. And if they're using a word and you're like, huh, they're saying this, but I'm not sure that this is what they mean. Like the word might mean something different to them. You can go ahead and ask them what they mean. Like, if they use different parts 
um, for, for body. Let's say you're trying to find out if somebody was sexually abused or something. And they call their genitalia by a certain use that word. You don't, don't have to correct them. You're just trying to make sure that you're using what they should have done yet. Same thing for events, locations, people. Try to match your language level to the language level you're hearing. Usually they say like sixth grade and below, everybody pretty much understands that. Maybe sometimes, maybe sometimes not, but try to match your level. You don't have to use big fancy words, you just in grad school. I know you hate to learn words, <laughs> I mean, but if your client doesn't understand them, they're not helping you anyway. Um, Double negatives are confusing. And, you know, we're bad about that. That's don't use double negatives, abstract things. Or you talk about the language system. Um, mean length of utterance. Short sentence. You get a short sentence from them, try a short sentence back. Sometimes it, it helps you know how much information they've been processing. And the single gloss sentences. Those are the ones that aren't the run ones. They're not the sentences with a bunch of conjunctions and, and things. Right? Short sentences. Your message is going to get through them. Um, so here's a slide that says it's a little problematic because it's generalization. And what we know now is that development's not so cut and dry, <laughs> okay? But in general, um, with all that you, by definition, your IQ range is somewhere between 50, 55, and 70, which is a pretty big range if you think about it. Um, they constitute the majority of people with intellectual disability. And they kind of went um, in Piaget's level of what's called concrete operations. Um, moderate ID is about 10%. That IQ range is 35 to 40. And, and the reason for the wiggle room is the margin of error on the test. Um, to up to where mall starts, and that kind of coincides with Piaget's pre, -op, pre operational stage. Um, severe 20, 25 to 35 to 40, and profound. They both kind of coincide with Piaget's sensory motor stage, but there's usually a lot of difference between somebody who's like adaptive behavior and their IQ and all that lands around 40, then there is somebody in less than 20. So big, big varieties of what people can learn and not learn and you know, communicate to you versus not communicate to you. Because these are huge chunks of the ability. So just to give you a little reminder on developmental psychology, <laughs> Piaget's century motor stage of development is that it's taking place from birth until the development of language. Um, with the development of language, an individual understands the world by integrating sensory information or behavior and actions. Individuals with severe to profound ID have limited to no development of language and it be considered to be functioning at the sensory motor stage of development. And that's, again, that's a generality. It doesn't mean that they all learn that language. But in general, they have more language deficits. Um, so you're more likely to have to take the history from your caregivers, right? Or whoever came with them. Um, but you can still, as a clinician, you're observing them for their appearance. 
uh, how they relate to other people. Right? Because you can kind of tell from watching somebody if if they want to be near another person or not, right? Or their body language. Um, what's your impulse control looks like? What's their activity level? Are they sitting still or are they all over your office and climbing up the wall? Um, are they doing anything that looks ritualistic or stereotypical? Um, repetitive behaviors? Anything that looks like what you would think a person might look like, might do to their anxious mind? Um, they have any involuntary movements, right? They might have spasms or ticks or something that have nothing to do with their mood. It's the way their their brain works, their muscles work. So you're getting a look at history from somebody else, but you're still getting information for yourself from watching their body language and their, their motor activity and their facial expression. So even if they can't talk to you, you can still, at some level, you're a human presence. Um, again, in general, people with moderate ID um, tend to function in preoperative pre stage of cognitive development. And so they're more likely to interpret the world in a concrete and literal manner. This is the kid you tell to get out from the associate, pop up from your desk and come help me at the keyboard. This is the kid get out of the chair slowly and walk to you. He might start hopping across the top. You're just little to think. Um, in children with typical intelligence, I think kids in the long range, like you, um, this is occurring around two to six years of age. Um, language development. Um, they tend to have more egocentric strength. Um, they're more likely to see things from their point of view rather than the point of view of other people. Um, a lot of times they have difficulty manipulating information, like taking um, one piece of information and drawing conclusions from it using deductive reasoning and things like that. It's hard in, in, in this stage. Um, Sometimes you have a tendency to focus on one aspect of an object or event while ignoring other facets. And um, a lot of times they have difficulty ranking importance of various aspects of a situation or an experience. So Likert scales, like, you know, rate your mood from one to 10, you know, how sad are you from one to 10? That might be difficult. Again, this is generality. Because not everybody who's got my ID. Um, all ID, and since they constitute 85% of the people diagnosed with intellectual disability, it's much of the people. Most likely, the people that you see are most probably going to be in there, unless you're doing trauma therapy, in which case, you're probably somewhere else. Um, those in moderate to mild range, like so the high end of moderate <coughs> to mild, um, tend to function at PJ's level of concrete operations. So they can think logically about concrete events, but they might have more difficulty understanding the abstract or hypothetical part. I use math as, as an example. They might be okay with adding they might be okay with doing subtraction but they're not going to necessarily get calculus right or geometry or division or multiplication it's just this right some people can't you know or you can have people that have the sort of like savants they have like highly accelerated skills in one cognitive area and Problems in other ones. Like I said it's not level, it's not uniform. So you may come across someone who's really good at hypotheticals, but for the most part, concrete's safer. Um, 
it's hard to take a general concept and use it to predict or determine the outcome of a specific event. Um, they might have difficulty describing symptoms to you and providing the subjective data regarding their emotions. And again, that a lot of that has to do with vocabulary. Like they know one word for unpleasant feelings and they use it to explain and describe things. And that's where you know the like the little emotion charts and stuff come in here to help them improve that, like broaden that vocabulary. Um, and it's something if you can do it, sometimes it's useful, like you have the same thing you're using in therapy as an aid for them to have it at home too. So they can use it in more than one setting and generalize it. Because it's going to help them look. Um, once they decide it's okay to talk to you, okay, you've had that therapeutic alliance and you've like you got through whatever defenses and, and they want to work with you, they're typically able to communicate in very genuine and authentic ways. Um, they're not as egocentric as people with more severe intellectual disabilities. Um, a lot of them are able to see things from other people's perspectives. Um, a lot of them are very, you know, generous and giving. They and, and this is like anybody in therapy. They might blame themselves for the bad things that happen in their life, and they might not have been So. You know, it's not too difficult. You just got to watch your language and make allowances that it might take longer. Um, in part because you want to do your psychoeducation and, and your interventions in smaller chunks. And also because a lot of the time, by the time they're coming to see you, they have very long histories of having things go bad in their life. And so it's not an easy problem to work. A lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about slang and jargon. Okay. Um, you want to be culturally sensitive, just like with anybody else. You don't want to give up because you may think that you're not making any progress, that you might actually be making progress. Um, Be respective of assistive and communicative devices and treat them like they're an extension of the person. So if a person does use a communication board or something, don't just go over there and start messing with it. Okay? That's their way of talking to you. That's theirs to mess with it. Okay? If they want help with it or something, you know, and if they ask for a number, they will show it to you. Fine, right? Um, if a person's in a wheelchair, don't just grab on their wheelchair and start moving them around. Okay. <laughs> That's not cool. The wheelchair is an extension of their body, right? Ask permission before you go. Get on their level. Don't let them stoop down over. Get on their level. Sit down as you can. Um, you're, you will learn their communication stuff. And when you do, you can use that as your format, right? Okay, this how many do you think I can do that? I'm sorry, guys. Um you're basically it's a recap. Okay, so you're looking at what the level of questioning is as a test. Give you a general idea of you know, where you need to start when you're communicating. You're looking at what symptoms, what got them referred, right? What happened? What are they doing? How does how does what they're doing now compare to how they were before? And that's sometimes hard information to get because it's 
especially if they're in the system and they're living in different like homes and stuff or paid support your person. They may be in a new home and nobody knows them. And if they're not good at giving you a history, it, it can be hard to get to know them. Um, so how are their mental health symptoms interacting with what their typical behavior would be right? or their typical level of function? All right, if you're dealing with somebody who doesn't use words to speak, it would be nice to know if they used to speak correctly and they stopped. Um, what are the stressors in their life? Who is the many who used to manage the stressors before? You know, and did they work? And what are your biases about intellectual disability? And how is that going to impact um, how you're going to engage in the future? We're human, we all have biases, whether you try to stand them out or not, you've got them. So you need to know what they are, what triggers them, like what when do they rear up, right? <laughs> and how are you going to manage that? Okay. It's about being self-aware. Okay, so You can do open ended questions, it's just sometimes you need to work up to one. So, have you, have you guys done anything on motivational interview? With, like, know basically what it is? So, this is familiar to you, you think it should be because that's where I'm pulling. Motivational interview works pretty well, okay? Um, so Open-ended questions can be helped to use uh, used to help facilitate the flow of communication, right? Affirmations are used to help the person restructure their view of themselves and how their ability to make changes, right? So so far it's just like regular in mind. Um, reflective listening is used to help patients feel that the psychotherapist understands their point of view. Is helped to resolve ambivalence by guiding patients to explore how their current behavior is impacting the overall quality of their life and the benefits of making positive change. Saying it's in line without people with IDD, right? And summaries are a form of reflective listening that reduce what's occurred in the session, used to draw attention to both sides of the ambivalence that the patient is experiencing, right? while promoting this sense of discrepancy, which then kind of is supposed to motivate people to make positive change. So it's all the same as you would do in my with somebody who didn't have that idea. You're just watching your language. Okay. And doing the things that will make you see these Um You might need to take a little more directive approach than I would like you to take. <laughs> okay. Because it's a, in a perfect world, you know, it's a collaboration, no one person's directing the other. With IDD, you might have to take a, a slightly more directive approach at times. Um, you might throw in some things like role playing, visual prompts. Um, therapeutic based activities to help facilitate their involvement. Because they may need to be doing something with their body to get one to keep their interest and two to help it kind of absorb and set what you're saying. Um, CBT. Most likely, you're going to have to have more sessions, and they're most likely going to need to be shorter. Um, it might be difficult for people with IDD to identify the abstract concepts like thought distortions that CBT talks about. Um, 
but you can address that by just allow treatment to progress in a slower way. We're just going to take more time to teach you the principles, and then we get it. Um, <clears throat> and the more you repeat the concepts, the better they're going to understand. It's not like I'm going to teach you about thought decisions today, and next week we're going to talk about something really different. You may be on thought distortions for a long time. <laughs> okay. Because, again, it's the slowing of the morning, right? Um, in this one, you're probably going to have to elicit the cooperation and support of caregivers if the person lets you so that they can go home and reinforce the same things you said in therapy. It would like, you know, more immersive, right? So you have to like, have helpers. Um, so, because that's gonna help like, if you were helping them identify cognitive distortions in your office, and then they go home and somebody hears them do it, and helps them realize they did it at home too. So the learning is taking place at home more than when you do. Um, you may also have to have caregivers help with things like the homework assignment. Because the person might not write, so they can dictate you know, on the um, Or if you want them to practice role play, the role play this stuff. Uh, so there's more repetition involved. There's more bringing in outside times. If again, if the person agrees to do it, if they don't, they don't. Do it. Oh. On this one, I had a vignette, um, the modified CBT. It was it's from a journal from the Journal of Eating Disorders. Friends, we give it to all of them. And so, with somebody with mild ID, um, she was in her late 30s, she was having trouble managing her emotions, and she had episodes of comfort eating. So, she was overeating. Um, and so, they got their information from clinical notes, the PCP. Sarah's mom is well done with their consent. They did, um, they, they did this during the COVID shutdown. So they were doing it remotely to get helmets, which is a little, so sometimes a more challenging to do therapy. Well, it's challenging to do therapy remotely anyway. And sometimes it's a little harder to get somebody to do. Um, so she lived in what they call, this is British, so she did live in what they call supportive accommodation with one other resident. So she was in a two person home, and people would come in and help her with the stuff she couldn't do on. Um, And she couldn't like go out because she had all right, she had Down syndrome, so she had to mask and stay away from everybody because she was at higher risk for dying. Um, and so she didn't get physical touch from anybody for a while because of COVID and from her illness and her genetic condition. Um, Before the pandemic, she went to the day center where she had a lot of social interaction with other people. Um, she was single and identified as a lesbian. Um, she had support um, when she came out. So that wasn't causing a problem for her. She was in a support environment. And, um, but she didn't have a girlfriend. She felt jealous of people who get that personal relationship. So, she was feeling lonely and she created an imaginary girlfriend called Sarah. So she wasn't actually psychotic, but because she was lonely, she created an imaginary girlfriend. 
um, she did have the hearing loss and she was supposed to wear hearing aids, but she didn't wear them. She struggled with weight management, even though she would work on diet and exercise and keeping a healthy lifestyle. But she was um, had a BMI of around 36, which is obese. Um, and she had some hormonal things. She was not found as good as a dementia screening because a lot of times people with Down syndrome develop dementia early. She was not found to have dementia. Um, her strengths were in social skills um, in terms of adaptive behavior. And um, they said that she displayed suicide ideation because she, she collected leaflets on suicide and pass them around to people. Um, and they decided that her comfort eating, which is their code for overeating, was a way to kill herself. So they were looking at it as an expression of suicidality, thinking that if she, um, that she could eat herself um, so because of these things, they suggested that she get a psychiatric health and counseling. So the first thing they did, the CBT, um, was to focus on developing a collaboration between Sarah, her mom, and the therapist. So they made like a little working team. Right? Um, they wanted to make sure that there was a good therapeutic alliance between Sarah and the therapist. They included the mom because the mom is a support identified by Sarah. So, so far, how does that differ from like if you were going to start doing counseling with anybody? Yeah. Maybe you wouldn't ordinarily do that. But with permission, you know, in this case, they found it, you know, to be beneficial. Um, Sarah created rules and set her own goals, which were adapted into a therapy contract. Okay, that's pretty normal, right? Nice, it's a goal. Um, they referred to him regularly to help build trust and rapport, and they slowed the pace down um, and did a lot of repetition. Therapists spoke slowly. Interventions were de deliberately repeated to encourage overrunning. So, like, even when they thought she had the concept down, they do it again just to make sure. They're doing is trying to help her develop new habits, right, and new ways of thinking. And so instead of just stopping where they thought she had it, they just opened it to make sure. Um, time was allocated for Sarah to provide feedback and discuss whether this session helped her reach her goal of normal eating. So they made sure to get her feedback each and every session and not to make assumptions. And they always tied it back into the goal. And these are things that are good to do anyway. Um, from the very first session, she shared her concern about how she coped with the eventual ending of therapy. So just like everybody else, you start your discharge planning at the beginning of therapy. Right. Especially with people with IDD who might look at you as an underpaid friend. You're establishing a relationship, you're explaining that this is not necessarily a lifelong thing. So that facilitated their having discussions around her feelings 
and coping with and planning for the last session. And they would throw parties to celebrate her process. So kind of promoting the idea of getting well enough to, to graduate from therapy is a happy event, right? It's so sad. Um, is there a request for mom attends every session? Um, and boundaries involving the mom's involvement were managed through continual checking in and feedback at the end of each session. The interventions were designed with the mom's input. Um, and that was because the idea was that if you enlist the caregiver's help and do what you need to do, then you're going to have better outcomes. Because they're going to go home and help reinforce what you're doing with care. Um, She had 15 appointments um, in which she and the therapist both brought items for that session's agenda. And she had the final decision on what topics were, what topics time was allocated to. So the therapist would say, I think we need to work on X, Y, and Z. Sarah would say, I think we need to work on A, B, and X. And then Sarah got to decide what was going on in the session to give her all the time. Um, so sometimes in the beginning, that might mean that the topics you discuss in, this, in therapy may not sound like they have anything to do with the overall group. They usually tie back in later, but at the beginning, they may seem totally unrelated. Um, because you can learn from whatever topic they bring you up. That helps you know what's on their mind, right? Or what they feel safe talking about. Um, in her case, it helped them understand some of her spiritual beliefs. And then they used that later on when they were doing their Limitations, because they were doing it remotely, um, they had problems with. Um, Communicating with her because she didn't want to, they were having to do it by phone a lot of times and she wanted to wear a hearing aid. So that was a problem. Um, but the caregiver was able to like serve as an amplifier. So like the caregiver would repeat what the group was saying. Um, they found out that she wasn't really concerned about the. You know, a lot of times people with eating um, disorders are concerned about what they look like. That wasn't what was driving her eating. She wasn't really concerned about her, her appearance and whatnot. So they learned that. You know? um, so they didn't focus on that, right? She didn't have that, that distorted view of her body. Um, It was more that they figured out it was just her way to manage intense emotions. And so they taught her different ways to manage intense emotions. They just gave her a replacement. Um, they would use um, like images with her that she could use. Um, apparently she had some physical things going on. So they did some education on like how she, when she ate this way, this way, this happened to her body. And so they gave her some more information. She needed to return. Um, they found that she appeared to benefit from the approaches. She had a reduction of target behavior, in which case this would be the comfort eating. And they did some outcome measure testing for both Sarah and her mom and thought she'd approved. So it's showing, I mean, I know that in, I don't know the whole thing, I just gave you a moment. But it's showing that it does work for people. You know, even when you're like, Measuring for research purposes, you know, outcomes and whatnot. 
and it's showing that in this case they didn't do very many modifications at all other than involve a caregiver more than maybe you would ordinarily and the session shorter and do the overloading that the emphasis on over teaching. Question or just stretch your point? Oh, no. It's cool. <laughs> I see movement and, and like because I work in IPA, like you know, I, I keep on movement because movement usually means you're trying to communicate with me. Okay, so any ideas on other things that maybe you might want to do different with, with CBT with some medical evidence? Just had a question. How do you go about the over teaching in a way that? That didn't come across like Just like in the review. That should be. They don't know that you may not over teach everybody. <laughs> you have to remember that. You know, they, don't, they don't know your normal way of operating. So they may think this is how you feed everybody. But you can vary it up a little bit. You know, we've been talking about doing this. Um, let's try practicing this, you know, and practice it a different way than you than you did the previous session. Because with CBT, there's practice. But you just need to remember that the people you're doing therapy with, whether they have intellectual disability or not, don't know your therapy style. Don't know how many sessions are devoted to learning, it, you know, a certain concept anyway. So as long as you're not acting condescending, you know, like you're talking down to them or something, you should be like, you know, they're like, I got this already. I'm tired of working on this. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Just like you would for anybody. Even if you don't think they have it, it's like, okay, we'll take a break from this. You know, we're going to come back to it later because that's how I roll. But, you know, just work on this instead since you don't want to work on it. So for BBT, um, so you know, sometimes CBT sessions can be kind of long. All right, again, you're going to want to shorten the time probably because the attention span, you know, people wander off. So you can't attend to two and a half hours straight, shorten them. Um, you might have your sessions put together. Um, you might have to sort it even more than you know an hour and a half. So what you're doing is you're you're still providing information. It's just a shorter dose, smaller doses at a time. Okay. Um, one group of researchers said you might even have to go down to thirty minutes and increase group work to twice a week instead of once a week. Um, because you're trying to provide the services in a way that matches the person's cognitive needs, as well as you're giving them more chances to practice under supervision. So if you're seeing them more frequently, that's more time for them to practice. More time for you to figure out if you're getting them. Um, simplify the concepts, and they actually have some pictures and stuff you can use. Or to illustrate concepts, um, diary cards, and like that. Modify the handouts to the person's level of cognitive ability. And again, there are people out there who've done that. So, uh, do more hands on stuff. Because again, experiential learning helps. And just like the other, you're going to have to collaborate a little more with caregivers if the person lets you. And you're going to basically have to do therapy with caregivers so that, or teach them about DBT so that they can reinforce what you're trying to teach. Um, and you're going to have to increase the number of sessions that are spent on each of the four skill modules. Um, so you're basically going to simplify it. Is easier easier to digest 
language easier to digest and other information in one country. Okay, they don't. Um, so corn therapy, again, you're, you're breaking down interventions in the smaller units. Know that it's going to take longer, that kind of sort of thing. And augment techniques with activities like therapeutic games for all well, for the using guidelines, things like that. Um, supportive psychotherapy <clears throat> already includes a lot of techniques um, that are helpful when working with people who have intellectual disabilities because it's a direct, it's it's more directive approach. Um, it does a lot of things with support. It uses um, techniques like suggestion, persuasion, reassurance. And so just kind of inherently, it's, it's an okay fit for people with that because of how it's structured. Um, it includes advocacy for patients, encouragement and involvement for concerned others, uh, helps improve your outcomes. And it's pretty flexible because it uses a lot of different techniques from other schools of thought. And so it's easy to modify or adjust to, to meet the person's emotional and cognitive quality. It's pretty flexible, so it's not too hard. Um, interactive behavior therapy, um, they haven't done a whole lot of research on using group therapy with people with IDD, but they have done some on this one. And um, they found it to be effective with people with IDD. Um, it's found to be effective in people who pose an increased suicide risk. Um, and it was specifically designed for use with people who have some sort of cognitive disability anyway. So it, it's a good fit for people with IDD. So it wasn't necessarily, you know, you have to have IDD to have this kind of therapy, but you could have a traumatic brain injury, you could have, you know, other things. And because it was designed to work with those populations that works well today. Um, it uses a lot of um, action based techniques that come from psychodrama. I'll ever play with psychodrama. So, because it uses those things, it's good because you're engaging, you know, like the talking part where you're learning and the body part. Um, so, the idea of since you're engaging in behaviorally and emotionally as well as verbally, it's helping them benefit from the treatments provided. And so these aren't necessarily, these aren't modifications, this is just kind of giving you an overview of sort of how the 90 session might work. Um, some of the techniques that are used a lot that were cool with the people that I um, you have doubling. So they share their, their view of the protagonist. Right? So the double backing in your voice reflection. And so if you're thinking concretely, but then you have to like pretend like you're the other person. Right? That's sort of a concrete way of helping you think abstractly. I know that sounds weird, but that's kind of what it boils down to. Um, same thing with role reversal. It's letting you do something concrete, but it also like helps them have these aha moments. Um, and so solilo soliloquizing and like these are this one has more for people who are farther along in the abstract thinking than thinking. Like, what do you see yourself doing like? So those are some techniques that are used a lot in MT and Um a lot of the people with IDD who are having a mental disorder, um, some of the common issues for psychotherapy are grief and loss and trauma. These, these guys are abused at a way higher rate than the general population. They're, they're easier targets. Um, and they have a lot of losses in their lives right now. Um, they might lose their parent. 
And their parent can still be alive, but they might lose their parent because they get put somewhere outside of their family home under the guise of treatment or because their parent can't deal with them or whatever. So a lot of times they have a lot of system that your general person might have. <coughs> staff turn them room it's a it's a source of loss because I thought you were my friend and now you're gone. The person's really just gone to get another job. But the the relationship, the caring relationship, they interpreted as like part of social service and a social circle, and all of a sudden that person's gone. Um, lots of familiar surroundings. People get picked up and moved from group home to group home. Or from facility to facility. Because maybe they're not behaving well. Maybe um, they have a medical need that can't be made where they're not where they were. Maybe the provider decides to turn a co-ed home into a single sex home or whatever. They just they get moved around a lot. Sometimes it's with their own input into it. It's supposed to be with their input into it. But sometimes it's not. <laughs> okay. So they lose, you know, friends, neighbors, you know, what they're used to. There's a lot of loss. Um sometimes like they've lived at home their whole life, their parents cared for them, and then the parents died, they've never known anything but their house, and all of a sudden they get put in an institution that has all the stuff that they're home. So, you know, grief it complicates grieving. Sometimes people aren't even told that their relatives are dead. There's somebody I worked with recently whose whose parent, whose surviving parent, hasn't told them that their dad is dead. To the point where they faked Christmas gifts from them and stuff. Because they don't want to look sad. Or they don't think the person's going to be able to grieve, so they don't want to. They don't want to tell them. The problem is you can't keep that facade up forever. When I was at the state support living center, I had a guy who was grieving. He hadn't been allowed to go to his mom's funeral, so he never had the closure. So we had field trips out to the cemetery. But it wasn't the same, right? You didn't have that, that ritual, that ceremony. So grief and loss are different. Good job. Um, you also have the fact that they have the disability, and they may grieve some of that. Because, um, <clears throat> you know, that goes to feeling like I'm less than it, or I can't do because I have land. Um, a lot of times you have difficulties with attachment because you haven't really had healthy attachment problems. So you didn't have a chance. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe when you were an infant, you got taken away from your mom because you had all sorts of medical needs and you had to go to the NICU. Right? So you spent a bunch of your childhood in you know hospitals and intensive care and stuff, and so you didn't want to learn to bond with people. And so that carries over into you know, adulthood and problems making relationships more. Um, I'm not going to go into all the different kinds of attachment disorders unless you're just wanting on this <laughs> But it's, you know, things like that, right? Um, sexuality, big one. All right. Human beings have hormones, right? They have sexual desires as a rule, not, not everybody. Um, People with IDD are like told, well, you can't have it. Or even more clearly, you get, they're required to be taught sex ed and then they're not allowed to act on it. Because it's against the rules of regular. So those kind of things bring up all sorts of um, behavioral and emotional challenges. Um, having to depend on people for everything. Be frustrating, especially if they're not moving at the pace you want them to, or not doing what you're asking them to do. 
and then um, pure depth, so like kind of can go out to um, pure people hurting. Them. Okay, so this is how grief and loss might look like in the human space or the development of life. So, even somebody with that IQ of 20, right, they may not understand death as the abstract concept, right? They may not understand that the person is gone, but they may still agree, right? And how they act might have to do with how the people around them are grieving. And if somebody's bothering to be explained things to them, or are they shutting out and not letting them see the funeral or not letting them see the goodbye, they might be. Um, so people in severe moderate, it might think that death is temporary and it can be reversed, which can cause some confusion when it doesn't you know, reverse itself. Right? You're also wanting to look at that one, like when somebody in this stage is threatening suicide. You want to make sure they understand that that is permanent. Um, because they may think that you know, you're dying. Um, religion kind of can be problems because you know, a lot of religions you know, preach that you know, there's an afterlife and whatnot. But the person with ID might think it's like now, immediate. You know, they, they don't they don't get the, the hypothetical theoretical construct in religion books. And so they're going to church, they're hearing it, they think it's gonna happen like next week. And everything's cool. Right? So you, you have to see where, where they're coming from, what they can call, you know, what the belief system. Um a lot of times they start to blame themselves for the person's death. So you're dealing with a lot of guilt for you have not Moderate to mild, um, they might understand that that happens, but why did it happen to me? So that's pretty much more like somebody who's not ready, right? They might feel anger around it. Um, they may be angry at themselves because they weren't able to save the person. Um, that's when you start seeing anxiety, depression, physical complaints, angry. Aggression, things like that. So, providing education is helpful. Letting them go through the ritual reading process is helpful. Um, you know, teaching them to, to identify their emotions about it and ways to express it without causing problems is helpful. Um, and you can use things, you know, um, like worksheets, you know, writing it out. I'm going to skip this one. It was just, um, it was a good example. And again, it's the British, the, the British were ahead of this one. <laughs> um, but they talked about how the person's parent had a terminal illness. And instead of hiding it from him, they told him what it was. And they helped him grieve as the illness progressed. And they included him in the funeral planning. Like he would somebody without a disability. And they included him in the funeral and his outcomes were better. Um, then, unfortunately, a lot of times they said people aren't going to lie to their parents. What did they act after that fear and start to like, That's what um, I mentioned there's a higher rate of abuse. Um, there was a dearth of trauma informed care. Sometimes people don't realize that things are common responses because their presentation is different. Um, so they might be aggressive or isolating or engage in more self injurious behaviors. Um, and people just attribute that to the IDD. So sometimes the trauma history is not very helpful. And that's a whole other topic. But know that that's going to come up a lot. <laughs> um, 
um, like for anybody with trauma, you want to make sure they feel safe. You want to make sure they have a sense of control. You want to try not to expose them to triggers if you know what the triggers are. Um, and provide guidance and support to the caregivers so that the caregivers can stop triggering. Um, so you're giving them, um, you're telling them what's going to happen so they're not caught up on it. This would be anybody who's just on it, right? You're giving them choice. You're giving them autonomy. autonomy. <laughs> um, like when do you want to meet? Where do you want to meet? You try to give them some control of those things. The problem with IEP is that they may be stuck to somebody else's schedule to get their needs met. They may be stuck to somebody else's schedule as to when it's convenient for them to bring them to your, your counseling office for appointments, right? So they don't get as much autonomy as they can, but whenever you can, work it out with the person to, to give them a sense of control and power. And um, that'll help with the trauma. So you're increasing the length of treatment. So again, this is just a review slide. You're adjusting the complexity of the interventions provided. You're reducing your vocabulary to their vocabulary when you can. Um, you're probably going to end up being a little more of a directive counselor than a hands off counselor. Giving visual cues, augment interventions with activities, because that's going to help them, the lessons stick better and involve caregivers for the therapist. So, Ethically, we want to use person first language. You don't know what that is? Good. So I didn't bring any copies for the um, Is what you're working on relevant to the client? Is it they need to remember who, who's, your, who's your employer? It might be an agency, right? And we want you to make so and so stop doing this, right? But you want to know is it relevant to the client? Is the real client, you need to know that because again, it might be the agency hired, but not the, not the person you're doing care for. So, is the person they're saying is the client, client willing to participate, or are they there because somebody brought them and helped them and told them they had to do it, or they didn't get their allowance for it? You want to know that. Are they receiving any benefit from the service? You want to provide age appropriate services, meaning appropriate for their crowd chronological age as well as their developmental age. And you want to do dignity of risk because a lot of times people aren't allowed to try things and fail when they have IP. You want to keep that in mind. It's all right to let them you know, try to expand their horizons. It's all right if they fail, but if they fail, you need to be there to help pick them back up. Because we can, I mean, we have to protect people. We don't, because there's a fine line between dignity of risk and client neglect. <laughs> so we have to protect people, but you have to allow them the chance to try to grow and expand. But you want to do it with a safety net so you don't have to fight. So these are something thing for that. You guys have questions. Are you guys awake? I think you're awake. Mm -hmm. Can you do me a favor? I've got this two ways. We can either do the survey for the grant with QR code, or if you prefer, or if your camera doesn't like my QR code, I have hard copies. So if y'all can take a moment. It's not bad. It does have a question on there about do you want CDUs? I can't give them to you. AM might be able to. I don't know if they set this up for it. Um, but it's anonymous unless you want a certificate of completion or, or some other certificate. If you do want one, make sure I can read your email and I'll, I'll email the certificate of completion. Nobody got blocked by a firewall. 
I'm checking because we use Google Forms and some people can get to them. Was my things or were you just? Yes. I tried to set it up through Microsoft Office, but once we found out that you can't clear out the number of people who answered the survey. So that causes a Does anyone have questions about? No. Thank you. 